Today we reflect on the readings from the fifth Sunday of Easter. Our first reading comes from Acts chapter 9. The response of Psalm is part of Psalm 22. Second reading is 1 John chapter 3, and our gospel comes from John 15. Our first reading today from Acts, we have a beautiful story with Saul, who is Paul, same name, different languages. But just imagine putting yourself in the scene. In this chapter, this is Acts chapter 9, 26 to 31. Earlier in the chapter, the beginning of the chapter is Saul's conversion, where he has that beautiful encounter with Christ, where he is knocked down, blind, and goes and is converted. And I love praying with this chapter because it's great to pray with the chapter, or with the conversion of Paul and everything that he goes through. And that beautiful phrase of, why are you persecuting me? When Jesus is speaking of the church as his body, which I think lays a foundation for much of his theology and just all those things in one short encounter with Christ changes his life in so many dramatic ways. Helps the church even 2,000 years later understand who she is. But imagine the people around him. So he's sent to Ananias and Ananias is told, you need to go meet that guy who's been killing a bunch of us Christians. You need to convert him. He said, encounter with me, bring him into the church. And again, imagine the fear, because the first chapter begins with Paul still breathing murderous threats. He's killed a lot of people, hunted them down, and put them to death. And now you have to talk to him. You have to now seek him out. We have that same attitude today where Saul arrives in Jerusalem because he's got to go and learn from the disciples. He's got to fill in the rest of his knowledge. He's got to spend time with them. And then Barnabas is the one that takes charge of him because we're told that the rest of the disciples were afraid of him, and rightfully so. And Barnabas means son of encouragement. So I think it's just beautiful that this man who just had a conversion, Saul, is taken under the patronage of the son of encouragement. They continue to go through and just speaks about how he proclaims Jesus, does great work. Again, a beautiful thing to pray with, especially for any of us that have to deal with maybe people we don't want to deal with or having difficult circumstances that we would rather not have before us. Just praying with Saul, praying with the apostles, the early church, those who have to welcome him after he had hunted them. And then our final two sentences today, we're told the church throughout all of Judea, Galilee, and Samaria was at peace. It was being built up and walked in the fear of the Lord. With the consolation of the Holy Spirit, it grew in numbers. And it's that fear of the Lord. We talk about this from time to time in homilies, that this is the disposition we're supposed to have before our God. It's not a fear of punishment primarily. It might be that, but that's the lesser meaning. It's ideally a filial type fear, a fear of a child, a fear of a friend, somebody that I don't want to hurt. I love this person so much I don't want to damage the relationship at all. I want to give them my very self. And when the people are living with that on the interior, that's when the church is able to be at peace and where the church is able to be built up. And so right now with our church, not at peace, how much turmoil, how much frustration, anxiety, fighting, bickering is going on inside the church. The church overall, especially in the Western world, is getting smaller. We are not growing. I think part of it is we are not living in that attitude of the fear of the Lord. And of course, you want to pray for that for the church throughout the world. So maybe spend some time praying for that this week, but also use it as an examination in your own life. Where are you not living in the fear of the Lord? Our second reading today comes from 1 John, as we had last week. And again, same author for our second reading and our gospel. And John, again, is continuing to speak of our relationship to God. He says, Children, let us love not in word or in speech, but in deed and truth. He's saying, don't just talk the talk, walk the walk. And he goes on to say, We need to live the commandment of Jesus. We need to do what God has told us we need to do. We need to hand ourselves over completely to God. And he says, and his commandment is this, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Which begs the question, how did he command us? And John would have heard this in Jesus' final hours. Love as I have loved you. John, the only apostle to be with Jesus when he laid down his life. It's most fitting that these words come from this apostle. It says, love like Jesus. Sacrifice for one another. As I talked about in my homily this last Sunday, your life is not your own. It doesn't belong to you. 
It's not about you. It's about God. How we're supposed to live for him. How we're supposed to live for our brothers and sisters in whatever our vocation may be. Maybe spend some time praying with that this week. Ask God to show you, where am I loving like Jesus? Where am I living that life of a sacrifice? Where am I putting other people before me in a way that Christ wants me to? Where am I failing? Where am I not living that out? And come up with a resolution on how we can continue to do better. That it's not enough just to say it. We have to do it. Their gospel. Again, also John. Beautiful insight, again, in our relationship to Jesus. And again, it shows us that we need to be close to our Lord. It also shows us that our Lord is going to have us go through difficult times so that we can grow. Today, Jesus gives us another I am statement. I am the true vine. My Father is the vine grower. He takes away every branch in me that does not bear fruit, and every one that does, he prunes so it will bear more fruit. He says, you are being pruned because of the world, of the word that I spoke to you. And remain in me. God will prune us. He will take things out of our life. Things that keep us from being as fruitful as we could be. And it's a beautiful practice, again, for us to maybe to look back on our life, identify those areas where God has cut things out of our life. Some of those crosses that we've had to deal with. Some of those difficulties that we've had to deal with. Where did God prune back? Maybe he took away something that we loved, something that we wanted. A loved one. A job. School. Other opportunities. But if we chose God, what did he fill that up with? How did he draw us closer to him? How did he help the people around us? It's a beautiful thing for us to look at how God used us in those difficult moments because it can strengthen our faith and help us continue to move forward with greater zeal, and greater energy. The entire purpose of this Easter season is to have these readings focused for our newly baptized, our newly initiated, to show them how they're supposed to live in the world. And as we know, time and time again, that means difficulty. The culmination of our Easter season is Pentecost, when the apostles go out and start moving concretely towards their death. They're going to die at the martyr's death. And you can even argue John, who died out in um, exile, died a certain type of a martyr's death. They love like Jesus. They sacrifice. And we are here today because of them. God pruned them for much fruit. And then we have in the middle of our reading today, just as a branch cannot bear fruit on its own unless it remains in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. And when I read this just a few minutes ago, my mind went back to that beautiful story of Peter on water. I know I've been referencing a lot, so maybe it's something good for us as a parish to spend some time praying with. But again, the boat represents the church. Jesus gets out and is walking towards Jesus. He starts to stumble, he starts to sink. Jesus takes him and puts him back in the church. So I think a beautiful thing to pray with that fits in very closely with our, our gospel today. And then he goes on to say, without me, you can do nothing. But what we tend to hear with this, and I know you've heard this from different people, is what we tend to hear is, without Jesus, I can do less. Or I can't do as much. He says nothing. And this I've mentioned it before from the rule of St. Benedict. All the good that we do is God working through us. We give credit to him. The only thing we get to claim is our sin. Again, praying with that idea, where do we need to prune ourselves? Where do we need to open ourselves up to God coming in and removing things from our life? Beautiful thing for us to reflect on as we move forward in this week. And if we stay close to him, we do what we're supposed to do. Jesus says our prayers will be answered. And again, going back to Jesus in the garden in his final hours, his prayer is, Father, I don't like this plan, but your will be done. If we finish every one of our prayers with those words that Jesus himself prays, that Mary prayed at the Annunciation, that Jesus puts in the Our Father, our prayers will be answered because God's will will be done in the end. Again, a couple things for us to reflect on. Please pray with these readings as we get ready for Mass this weekend. God bless. Mm -hmm.